to everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, we're at, we were holding in the middle of a Dvar Malchus for, um, before Nisan in preparation for Yer Aleph Nisan. I'm going to take this class and pause. I will not continue that sicha for now. I will continue that Bez Hashem next week. I think it's very, very important that we reflect on something that I feel is important uh, for everybody to uh, to hear. And um, even though I'm not teaching directly a, a Dvar Malchus talk tonight, um, I feel that the, the information is uh, important enough to warrant a, a, a pause and a little bit of a a, um, wh wh why am I hearing a weird noise on the phone over here? Hold on one second. Hello? Okay. I think we're good. Um, to pause a little bit and to take in what's happening. Okay. So it seems like, you know, so I'm, as I mentioned, I'd like to take a pause this week and focus on something related to this week's Parsha and um, to perhaps give some clarity on things that are happening. Because we learned Var Malchus and we're learning the Sichas, but what's, what's extremely potent is because we've had these Sichas for years and obviously we all sense that there's a certain reawakening to study again the Sichas of Nanalaf and Unbeis and to feel them and to sense them and to recognize that they're applicable, that they're applicable to us today. But I think one of the, one of the things that, n that, that, that give that a strong sense of both learning them and, and, and seeing and feeling their urgency is because we look around in the world and we're sensing deep inside of us that things are changing and that there's a certain energy of ge'ula, of redemption that is here in the world and that it is it is manifesting every day more and more and more. And that's what calls us within us an excitement and a desire to go back to the Rebbe Sichas uh, 27, 28 years ago and to relearn them and re-examine them and see if we can lean uh, understanding and appreciation about what's going on. So, um, you know, last week was Purim. And on Purim this year, Something astonishing happened, out of nowhere, out of bolt of lightning, no one was expecting this. There was a tweet uh, coming from the president in which he said that he's recognizing the Golan Heights. He says, after 52 years, it is time to recognize Israel's sovereignty on the Golan Heights. Now, this is something that Rebbe's been fighting for me, that Rebbe Bechlau felt that we should declare sovereignty over all the land of Eretz Yisrael and everything that Israel conquered during wars, you shouldn't be even a, 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 a even, even the slightest uh, hint that we even are thinking of a possibility of, of giving land to the Arabs. We're fully, I mean, the rights that we have to the land is based, is biblical, it's based on the Torah, it's based on the Abish's promise to Avram Avinu. And therefore, there shouldn't be, an, and, and really it's unheard of of any country, even, even without such claims to a land uh, that is attacked and, and, and uh, gains land in a legitimate war which was put upon them, that they should have any obligation to give it back or to give that land. In this case, it's not giving back land because it's land that belongs to the Jewish people for thousands of years. But it was a shock that it came to us uh, like out of nowhere on Purim, there was such an announcement. And then um, it was fully um, recognized and signed by an executive order of the president uh, this past Monday. This past Monday, uh, Netanyahu was at the White House, there was a ceremony and the president officially Acknowledge, which means that that's the official stance of the United States. The president has the full power to do that. Obviously, it's not the whole world recognizing it. The uh, European Union is, of course, we couldn't expect any difference, saying that they're not recognizing, but this is what happened. Now, this is not an isolated event. This is an event that comes in continuation to certain things that, that, that the president has done, which were all shocking. It began with the recognition of Yerushalayim, um, which also happened on an auspicious date. It happened on Yutes Kislev. And as I mentioned many times, that really the origins of it happened on Yudalev Kislev, which is the, the Rebbe's anniversary, because that's when he did not sign the waiver 
that all the previous administrations continued to sign to push off the, the, um, the, um, uh, the law that has been passed by Congress that the embassy, that, that Jerusalem should be recognized as the capital of Israel, Yerushalayim, and that we should move the embassy there. And every president kept on delaying it by signing a waiver every six months. And the, on the night of the Rebbe's Chasana, which is Yud Dalit Kislev, which I discussed the whole thing, it has to do with Malchus Beis David and so on and so forth. Uh, and the, uh, right um, at that time, he didn't sign it, and then so that was one one thing. And then officially, and Yutas Kislev is when he made the official announcement to the entire world. It was Yutas Kislev, the 19th of Kislev in Yerushalayim, which is unbelievable because you think about you know Yerushalayim. This is what we've been davening for Yerushalayim. I mean, if there's anything Mashiach big in the world, is when Yerushalayim is recognized as the Ir Hamlucha. Especially Yerushalayim is the capital of King of David Amelech, which is Mashiach Tzedkenu's capital. Other than it's the fact that that's the place of the base of Mingdash. Yerushalayim can't be split. Yerushalayim can't be contested. It's the everlasting capital of the Jewish people. That's where our hearts and minds are, prayers. Everything has been aspiring to Yerushalayim. Who would have dreamt? And what it taken into consideration was that the, the tremendous anti-Israel um, um, atmosphere that was in the United States government, it, it, it was always that way from, from the State Department. But it was also in, 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 in the administration, the previous administration. The Congress was always generally uh, supportive of Israel. Uh, but it was a pretty interesting mix. You know, support of Israel, going to see Sue, support of Israel, but not complete support of Israel. Um, but but um, the, the, the administ previous administrations, as it was going on the last couple of years, were kind of veering away from their, from their very, very su strong support for Israel especially um, under the influences of uh, the Obama administration, and especially leading into Hillary, which we know has already a history. Uh, Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton had a history of uh, supporting the PLO. And um, here, and, and, uh, and, and, um, and that's where you, you saw it was, it was going. I reached a climax. I'm just, I'm just reviewing some of the ideas because we want to put things into perspective. It reached a climax in the pre uh, previous administration, was an, an all-out war against Israel in two atrocious acts, which was unheard of in the United States. Number one, to go ahead and make such a deal with Iran, which Iran has been stating again and again and again, over and over and over again, that their intention is to wipe out Israel off the map. And here they are, and they made an, a deal with them, and they gave them billions of dollars, and that money that they were gonna, and, and again, what was the, what was the, what was the, what, what did Iran have to, even if we couldn't trust Iran, and even if we, you know, we weren't gonna check all their hidden military installations, okay? So that's totally absurd, ludicrous. But even if we to trust that they're really keeping to the deal, it was only for seven years. And then after seven years, there's no restrictions at all. I mean, it's, it's insane. So that means basically saying in seven years, seven years passed like nothing. You can go ahead and build your nuclear weapons that you've wanted to do all along. So that was basically, the United States official government signing off to a government that it can threaten the very existence of the Jewish people. Uh, millions of Jews in Eretz HaKadosh and Eretz Yisrael. So that's unbelievable. That was the, the worst atrocious act of anti-Semitism by the American government or anti-Israel. And then, of course, there was a few days Mamash, the last, one of the last things that happened in the Obama administration was that they allowed for the UN whatever resolution to pass. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't um, vote for it, but they did not veto it. The United States has the power of veto, and they didn't vote, which says that the that uh, East Jerusalem and and which includes when I say East Jerusalem, I'm talking about uh, the old city of Yerushalayim, the Kaisel Amaravin, Kaisel Amaravin, where we all go to Davin. The old city of the Jewish quarter, it's all occupied territories, illegal land, we're not allowed to have it. To allow that, um, that America should make such a statement, basically literally plunging a dagger into the heart of, of, of the Jewish people, into the heart of Eretz Yisrael. So it's clear that there was a, such a anti-Israel movement going on and getting stronger and stronger. And Rahman al what would have happened had it continued into a next administration that would have picked up from the previous administration. And who knows, would have made things worse and worse. Now we're seeing in, the dem in, the, in, the, uh, in general on the Democrat Democratic Party how many anti-Israel uh, representatives are coming in. You have this Omar, you have so on and so forth. So this would have only gotten worse and worse and worse, Talib or whatever her name is. 
So, and so suddenly over here we saw this unbelievable miracle, which was a complete shocking turnaround, which you see clearly it was the hand of the Abish there. And what happened was is that the, the election of Donald Trump, which as I mentioned, I mentioned so many times, he, he was such an so impossible for him to be elected. He was when we had 16, I think, 17 contenders in the Republican Party. He was laughed at as like the 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 the, the one that definitely is not going to win. And yet, despite all all predictions, he led the pack all the way to the end. Everybody kept on falling right and left. He was the only survivor. And then he stood up against Hillary Clinton, which was a no-brainer that she was going to win. And with Mamish clearly divine intervention with the whole Clinton scandal and with the Comey situation of tw uh, 11 days before the election, he drops the bomb that Comey, who is the biggest enemy to Trump, it, it drops a bomb that they're reopening the investigation and that basically completely changed the, the polls dramatically. I mean, unbelievable. You saw clearly Mamish Nisim Nisim talking about Arena Nufla, he's seeing wonders that the Abish to wanted Trump to be, to be president. And Pompeo, Okay, he was the Secretary of State today, said that he believes, he said it, to, and it was, this is reported on the BBS, okay, the BBS, this is not, uh, th they're quoting Pompeo, they're not saying their own thing, but they quoted Pompeo in a whole write-up in which they say, or an interview with him, which th he says that he believes that God was the one who put Donald Trump into office to save, his whole, sole purpose was to save Israel from Iran, from the, from the, Sa which means save from the, God forbid, the annihilation of Israel. So this was unbelievable miraculous. Now, it has to do with the Rebbe. Why does it have to do for the Rebbe? First of all, these are all the things the Rebbe fought for. Who's the one in charge of the Jewish people? That's the Rebbe. Secondly, we saw Ivanka and, and, um, um, and, 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 and Jared Kushner go to the oil a few days before, publicized. They went to Daven. And remember, I mentioned this other times that, you know, the last two years, this whole election was so impossible in the minds of so many people that Donald Trump won that they, they claimed that this must have been some kind of a meddling. Who meddled? The Russians meddled. And we just completed a two-year investigation where it turned out that the whole thing was a farce. The whole thing is based on what seems like, and it seems like to be coming out more and more now, that the whole thing was based on a corrupted... Uh, uh, stuff going on in the CIA or in the FBI, in which they 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 they, they came up with whatever whatever it was, uh, a false documents or false dossier as they call it, and claiming that Trump was involved, so on and so forth. And but th this they mentioned they, they did a badikas chametz. They put up this Mueller there for two years, and he's searching and he's searching. And in the end, turns out no collusion. Okay, they can't prove collusion, and the president is vindicated. But yet we know that everything has a shayrish lamayla. So they're saying Russian, Russian, Russian intervention. I mentioned this two years ago and it occurred to me. Russian intervention, the only thing left in the Russian intervention right now is the Rebbe and the previous Rebbe, who are the Russians in a sense, who were involved with this because to take America, chas v'shalom, down the wrong path, to cause America to be on the wrong side finally in history, against Eretz Yisrael, against holiness, against godliness, would have been the worst devastating thing for the United States of America. So simply to save the United States, not, I don't even know if it's to save the Jewish people because to save the Yidin, the, you know, the Abish would take care of us. But the fact that the United States that has been good to the Jewish people would have, God forbid, stood on the wrong side of history when Mashiach comes, that shouldn't happen. So instead, this whole, this whole meddling, so to speak, this whole unbelievable thing of President Trump becoming president and as going back, Yut, um, the announcement on Yerushalayim, then the freeing of Rubashkin, which was tremendous, and when did that happen on Zeis Hanukkah? Then pulling out of the Iranian uh, deal, which is literally saving the Jewish people, saving Kola Ama Yoshev and finally on Purim, an announcement regarding the Golan, which, as we said, you know, how many administrations are there since 52 years ago, since Israel conquered it in the 67 war? How many administrations? And Israel has absolute legitimacy to it, and no one would say it. And here it is announced, and it's already established. And once it's established, and once it's announced, there's no going back. So this is all unbelievable nisim the flies. Now, I came across something which I want to share, which I think is really, really exciting. And it's related to this week's parasha. And things that the Rebbe said, and it's related to, the, to, 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 to see to see the underpinnings of what's going on from a more spiritual, godlier place. 
So this week in the parasha we have all the, the Torah tells us about the, the kosher and the non-kosher. So right away we meet an animal that we're very familiar with, and it's the symbol, it's the ultimate symbol of non-kosher is a pig, the chazer. So first it mentions three, because in order for an animal to be kosher, it needs to have two signs. It has to chew its cud and it has to have split hooves. And there are three, and that's, it has to have both. There are three animals, the gomel, the shafan, the arneves, a rabbit, uh, the hare, the, um, the, um, the, uh, the camel, they have, um, uh, uh, they chew their cud, but they don't have split hooves. And, then there's, and, 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 and so they're not kosher. And then finally, we have the chazer who has a split hooves, but he doesn't chew its cud. He's not a marle geira. That's what it says, chazer. So we know it's a famous statement uh, which says, it's traced, it's a whole question where the origins of this is. But it says that this that Chazer is forbidden is only today's days. And the end of days, Asit Chazer li tire, that Chazer is going to become kosher again. Now there's a whole discussion about this, that this means literally. Uh, does this mean in the literal sense that a Chazer is going to become kosher? If a Chazer is going to become kosher, how can you say that? We know Zaysa Torah lo Yisai Mochulef, it's one of the principles of Torah is that the Torah will never be, the Torah will never be exchanged. You can't change halacha. So halacha is established, it is permanent, it is forever, it's unchangeable. So the Mepharshim say, the Arachayim HaKadosh, it begins with the Ramama Panoi, in, in Sefer Asar Mamaris, the Arachayim HaKadosh, the Chassam Sefer. And um, those are the three, and then there, maybe there are more as well, who claim that... Um, the reason the Chazar is, and it means literally, the Chazar is going to be kosher. You can, after Mashiach comes, you can eat pig. But that's because the nature of the pig is going to change. The pig is going to begin to chew its cud. It doesn't do that now, but it's going to do that after Mashiach comes. Others argue, Rabbeinu Bachaya and the other Mepharshim, and Rabbeinu Bachaya is already from the Rishonim. And he said that this that it says that the reason why it's, and that's why it's called Chazar, is because Asid Lachsar Li Yisrael is going to return to the Jewish people shouldn't be understood in the literal sense that physically the pig is going to be permissible to eat but rather he says that when it says that the pig is going to become kosher it means the force that, that the, the pig represents and what's the force that the pig represents? So he brings from the Medrash it's Medrash Rabba you can look it up in Parshas Vayikra which discusses the four kingdoms are compared to these four animals and the last one, the Chazer, is referred to the last kingdom, which is Malchus Edom. And we know always from way back that Esau is compared to a Chazer. It's the famous thing, the Kusha Chazer Fisa, the Kasha Chazer, which, because the Chazer has this nature, the pig, is that he sticks out its foot and he says, I'm kosher. Now, he, and really, he's not kosher, but he tries to show off and pretend it's fake righteousness. He pretends righteousness. Um, and we say that about Esau, because Esau always pretended to be righteous in front of Yitzchak, right? He would ask him all kinds of pious questions. And then he went and he, did, and he got married when he was 40 because he says, his father, my father got married when he's 40, even though earlier than that during, uh, he was, he was um, involved in, 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 in snatching women away from their husbands. And so Asa was a real wicked person, but he pretended outwardly that he's a tzaddik. That's what he's compared to the pig. But Edom in general is compared to the Chazer. And when it says that Asit Chazir Lachzer Li Yisrael, Umazu Lachzer Li Yisrael, or Chazir to, re, to, to become Tahir, to become pure, Rabbeinu Bachaya says it refers to a transformation of the nation of Edom, that Edom is going to do tshuva. And that he actually even goes so far to say that Edom is going to be build the third base of Migdash. They destroyed the base of Migdash and they're going to build the third base of Migdash. Not much words this week in the parish. I mean, he says, um, he says the first two Batim Migdash were built by Jews. Shleim HaMelech and Zerubavel, and even though, and, but Zerubavel at least, in the second base, Mishra got permission by Koresh to build it. But then he says, Aval Abayis HaShlishi, the third temple, Asidu Umma Zulav Noisa, this nation is going to build it. V'zau Sha'amr, Asid La'achzer Atar Liyosh, that the Medrash also says that the reason it's called Chazer is going to return the crown to its, to its, to its original owner. That means they're going to return the crown to, the, to, to Melech HaMashiach. And he says, L'fi Shehu Achrivai, because he destroyed it. And then he brings the other girsa, that it means that the Chazer is going to be become Torah. The very forces of Edom are going to return to help the Jewish people. Now who's Edom? Our Barbanel already, already establishes that Rome is Edom, even though Edom is a country next to Eretz Yisrael. The Barbanel establishes that, it's, that, it, that really it's, it's, it's Rome, and he proves it from many places. And then he goes on to explain that it's really the Christian countries that all emanate from Rome, because the seat of Christianity at the beginning was in Rome. 
and then later it disseminated. So the entire Western Christian world is all Edom. On the one hand, we say that Edom is the worst of the worst. Um, they cause the, 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 this Golos is the worst Golos. But yet it says that out of all the nations, Edom has a future. And what's the future of Edom? Is that Edom will do tshuva. And they will support, they will hand the crown to Melech HaMashiach. And they're going to support, as Rabbi Bahai says, the building of the third base on Hingar. So can that be something that we're beginning to see over here in the United States? But we also see that there's a powerful, powerful struggle. And we see a tremendous tension. We see a war against the, this president like we've never seen any other political figure be under such a war. And it's clear that it's a spiritual battle. It's a battle for the soul of the country. But to really appreciate and understand a little better, I want to share with you as follows. In recent days, we're learning chitas. And the chitas that we're learning, we're learning tanya. So Tanya is talking about in Perek Lamed Zayin and Tanya how the whole purpose of creation is realized. But before we get there, I want to say one more, one more point. And that is that, as an introduction, the Tzemach Tzedek brings this whole idea of Asit Chazir Litoyer. And he says, what's the difference between the Chazir and the three other animals? Why they're not going to become kosher? They also have, only have, they also have one sign. Why is the camel not going to be kosher? Why is the Shafan and the Arneves, the, the rabbit and the hare, why won't they become kosher? And, they explain, and he explains, the reason is because those three animals represent Shalish Klippai Satmeis, the three impure Klippais. And since they are the three impure Klippais, they're not elevatable. Now for those people listening to the Shir, I don't have to explain. Shalish Klippai Satmeis are the darkest elements in creation that are not redeemable. And what we have to do with these things is we have to destroy them. They don't, they cannot be elevated. At such levels of darkness. And that's why I represented, as explained in Tanya, all non-kosher stuff. All the stuff that the Abishter says we're not allowed to eat or we're not allowed to engage in any action that's forbidden. It's energy, if you, uh, uh, any sin, it's energy is derived from the three impure clippers. And therefore we have to just reject them because we can't elevate them. Then, however, there is a fourth klipa called klipas noga. Klipas noga is a glowing shell. It's the part of the world that is meant to be elevated. And that's the fourth klipa, and that we can elevate. It's a mixture of tov and ra. In its current state, before we rectify it, before we fix it, it's not holy. But it's also not as ugly as the three impure klipas. It means it's not holy, but it's not as dark as them. And, that's pre and precisely because of that, it's redeemable. And that is everything that is permissible in this world. Whatever is permissible doesn't mean it's holy. It depends what we do with it. If we use it for anybody that learns Tanya knows this, if we use it for a godly purpose, we elevate it. We make a bracha, and we have the right intentions, we serve Hashem with it, the energy gets elevated. And if we don't, chas v'shalem, then we don't elevate it. But not only don't we elevate it, but we can actually drag it down. And that's the idea of klipas noga. Our job in this world, the Alter Rebbe says in Perik Lamed Zayin and Tanya, our job is to elevate the entire klipas noga. And when we elevate the entire klipas noga, then the world, then we reach Mashiach. And the whole purpose of all of our Torah and mitzvahs is to elevate Klippas Noga. In other words, to elevate the pig. If the pig represents Klippas Noga. The Tzemach Tzedek says that the pig is Klippas Noga. The other three are Shoshim. Now you're going to ask me a question. If so, why is the pig not, not a kosher animal? Klippas Noga is kosher. That means everything from the world of Noga is kosher. So the pig should be kosher. So again, he doesn't explain it, but this is my own take, my own understanding is. That everything, all kosher animals, cows, sheep, goats, and the non-animals, grass, trees, fruits, all vegetation, all minerals, everything that's not forbidden, all stuff that are most of the bulk of creation, of the substance of creation, they receive their vitality from God, but it goes through a klipa, a shell that covers called klipa snoiga. They're elevatable because that's our job. We're supposed to take them and elevate them. But they don't, re they don't stand for Klippas Noga. They're not the symbol of the Klippas Noga. They are derivatives from the Klippas Noga. The pig is a representative of Klippas Noga. So you can't say the pig is kosher because the, the Klippas Noga, is, Noga will not be kosher until we're done elevating the entire thing. In other words, when, is, when can we say about Klippas Noga that it's elevated and it's holy and it's godly? That is only when Mashiach comes. And so that's why the pig then will become kosher. Because then Noga will be in, a, in its elevated state. That's what the Tzemach Tzedek says. Now, going back to Tanya. So in Perek Lamed Zayin and Tanya, the Altarev explains how our work in this world is all to elevate 
and, he, and he says like this, all of our Torah mitzvahs, we want to be mamshich or, we want to mamshich, we want to draw forth godly light, divine, or in self, infinite light, and we want to bring it down into this world, which this world is klipa. And we want to permeate every part of the world with the Orin Sof. By doing what? By peeling away the klipa and allowing and drawing down light through a mitzvah for the Orin Sof to manifest. And then the Alter Rebbe goes on to explain the technicality of this, which is really awesome. And he says like this, that the reason why when we elevate klipa snoiga, we elevate all of creation and, and the world will ascend from its darkness. Is first of all, we have to note like this. Let me go back to the question. I mentioned earlier that the Chazer is representing Klippa Snoga. If the Chazer is representing Klippa Snoga, which Klippa Snoga is not such a bad Klippa, why do we make the Chazer the ultimate sign, the pig, the ultimate sign of non-kosher food? Like the worst thing you can say a Jew will eat is Chazer. You say camel meat is much worse. Horse meat is much worse. It's Shalosh Klippa Satmeas. And, 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 and a rabbit meat is much worse. Why is the Chazer the ultimate symbol? So the Tzemach Tzedek explained, and why do we find that if uh, Rome is compared to Achazer, that they were the cruelest to our people. They caused the worst persecution. More than any other nation. If, 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 if it's Klippas Noga. And the answer is, Klippas Noga is a very big cul culprit. Klippas Noga is a real troublemaker. Why? Even though it itself is not so dark and not so low. In other words, it's capable of godly consciousness. But it serves as a medium. It serves as a conveyor of energy to the three, the three, the three other clippers. In other words, it itself, she herself, is not so evil. But her evil is in the fact that the other three impure clippers, which represent the real, real dark stuff in the world, would not have any, any life, any existence on their own. They need to receive their vitality and their energy through Klippa Snoga. Um, because the, the Shalosh Klippas Atmeyas can't access it. Every, all, all energy, all life force comes from Kedusha. The three impure Klippas, if they would try to approach to receive directly from Kedusha, they would become electrocuted. They have no access to Kedusha. So what they need to do is like this. They receive vitality from Noga. Noga is a mixture of good and bad. And the way it works is like this. Since Noga is Eitz Adas, Tov Ra, good and bad, so the Tov that's in Noga receives from Kedusha because it's Tov, it's good, so Kedusha can support it. Then the Tov of Noga gets mingled with the Ra of Noga, with the negative elements of Noga. And then the Ra of Noga supports the real dark evil, which is Shalosh Klippas Atmeis. Comes out that the real Roish, the real head of all the Klippas, Roish is Goyim Amalek. Amalek is from Esau. It's the racious, it's the beginning and the support for all the klipas. Therefore, the Alter Rebbe says an amazing statement. When klipa, when we get our point of Torah and mitzvahs is to cause the tov and the ra from Noga to separate. Where the tov and the ra separate, so the, and what happens to the tov? The good potential in Noga gets elevated in Kedusha. The ra remains the dregs of Noga, fall away. Once they have no energy from Kedusha, they're reduced to nothing. There's no more life force to it. And once that happens, the real, real dark Klippas have now been, been completely cut off. They have no life force. And automatically they're going to disintegrate. Okay? That, that's what the Alter Rebbe explains. How do we do this work of elevating the entire world of Klippas Noga? How do we do that? So the Alter Rebbe explains. He says that why? That each and every one of us have an effort. We have an effort kiss. Our nefeshul kiss, our godly soul, is a representative of, whole, of holiness. We are the ones who bring holiness down into the world. And our neshama only came down into the world, as the Altar Deb explains in chapter 37 in Tanya, not for her own sake, but to rectify the body, the, the animal soul, which is part of the klipa, and the body, and via the body, the entire world. How does that work? Our neshama comes from holiness. Our animal soul is a representative from Klippas Noga, because it's a Jewish animal soul. And it's in a body. The body is also kind of Klippas Noga, the big before we fix it. But the Alter Rebbe says that our, each and every one of our animal souls is connected and wired up with a certain section of this world. The world let's take a look at the, the, the Alter Rebbe says the entire world is divided into 600,000 parts. Each part is allocated and connected to one nefesh of Bahamas. And there's one corresponding neshama. 
And then the Alter Rebbe says, just parenthetically, that each one of these neshamas and each one of these nefesh bahamases, which have 600,000 of the entire universe connected to it, is each one connected to another 600, it's splintered into 600,000 pieces. That means each and every one of us has a 600,000th of a 600,000th of the universe to repair. It's still a lot, and the universe is big. And the Alter Rebbe says like this, when we as a Jew use all of our koiches of our nefesh of Bahamas to do mitzvahs, so we're elevating our nefesh of Bahamas to kedusha. When we do not do an Avera, because chatz v'shalom, if we do Avera, we allow the, th the three impure klipas to hack our soul and to derive energy and strengthen the klipa. So when we don't do an Avera, we stop, we clog, we close the entranceway from all the three impure klipas not be able to derive energy from us. Plus, through the performance of mitzvahs, we draw the abishter down into our animal soul and into our body. Via our body and our animal soul, through the food we eat, the clothing we wear, the homes we have, and all the interaction we have with the world, we elevate that 600 thousands of a 600,000 of the universe. And when all the Jewish people, as a accumulation of all the Torah and mitzvahs, what we've done, the entire klipa snoga is elevated. And what happens instantly, once the tov of Noga is elevated into Kedusha, the entire world becomes a keli, these are the words of the Yalta Rebbe, where the orange self can fully manifest, which is going to be Moshiach. And automatically, he says, Yizbalu v'yizbatlu kol asitra achra. The whole, the sholosh klipas atmeyas are automatically, v'al yedeze yizbalu v'yizbatlu legamre kol asholosh klipas atmeyas, they're going to be completely destroyed, ki yinikosam v'chiyusam ha'kedusha, because they're deriving their energy from holiness, ach shavu aide klipas noiga, is through klipas noiga, again, that's that chazer, that's that pig, hamu mutzas peineyam, that's between them, benimtza, and therefore he says that the whole tachlis of Yom Oisam HaShiach is about elevating that chazer. Now, if we put two and two together, and we say that the chazer represents Edom, that means that Edom, Esav, he's that Klipas Noga. That's why we talk and learn in Hasidus so many times that Esav is the world of Toyu and Yaakov is the world of Tikkun. And Yaakov has to fix the world of Toyu, the world of Esav, because Esav is that one that needs to be fixed. He is, he is that Chazer, he is that Klipas Noga that needs to, be needs to be elevated and needs to be purified. And we say that in the end, as a result of all of Torah Mitzvahs, we have impacted Esav, that Esav is elevated. So where do we see, if, if this is all just Hasidus, so this is reality. If we're saying now that we're holding Tavshin, uh, Ayin, Tess already, and we're already 20, close to 30 years after the time that the Rebbe said, Igiyaz Mangul Aschem, shouldn't we be seeing physical evidence of this in the world? Well, first of all, you have to say, and this, I've been saying this a lot, that the um, United States of America is already a refined Gentile. It's already a certain uh, 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 um, um, elevation of humanity. That humanity stands on a much higher state with certain moralities and certain ethics and certain beliefs and so on and so forth. It's a, cult, it's a society that has never been here before. But America itself goes through its own struggle. And if I can say America is compared to that, to that, the Klipas Noga, the standing on the fence, well, let's take a look at the history of the United States of America. On the one hand, there was a country that was been the nicest to the Jews. We have never seen any other nation been, extend a hand of loving kindness to the Jewish people. So that's amazing. And they've been always standing as a big brother to Israel and always been giving support and billions of dollars and so on and so forth. But they never ever gave the full support. Never. The United States of America never lent its full support behind Israel. Every time Israel went to war, they would give them the give them a, a, a encouragement, give them help, but at the same time tie their hands behind their back. So did President Bush. And if you go back earlier during the Holocaust, we find that America was a safe haven for the Jewish people. Jews came, flocked the country. But we also know that America had information about the horrible atrocities that were going on in Auschwitz and all the camps. And they could have bombed the tracks and they didn't do so. And they could have saved millions of people, they didn't do so. So America is not clean in that sense. There is, so they, they and when it comes to Israel, okay, so they support the Jewish people, but you realize when you don't you know, the question is, when a terrorist comes and shoots up, God forbid, a bus, or b bombs a bus, or goes into a restaurant and kills little children, who, who did it? You say, of course, it's a terrorist. It's this Arab, it's this terrorist, he's a monster. So they realize the monster doesn't begin with this monster. The true monster is the editor in the New York Times who gives legitimacy to the cause, or the writer in the New York Times, who takes 
and, and it makes the Palestinian people sound like tremendous victims. And Israel is a horrible aggressor. When you give legitimacy, and, the, and these people that are being nursed they're from a mother's milk with hate, and they're being given legitimacy, and they're being told and, 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 and that the world recognizes that. And even the United States of America is, 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 is not recognizing Israel's author, uh, uh, um, 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 that Yerushalayim. You see, once the United States doesn't recognize Jerusalem, that means Jeru Yerushalayim is up for grabs. It's negotiable. If it's negotiable, if we apply pressure and we kill Jews, God forbid, then we're going to get the prize. That's what they've been taught. So you realize that actually by not acknowledging the, the, the Israel's right on Yerushalayim, Israel's right on the Golan, Israel's right to Judea and, Sam, and Samaria, to, 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 to that whole area, if we don't, which what they call the West Bank, by calling it the West Bank, that itself, occupied territories, gives the United States blood on their hands. Because you're the leader of the free world, and Israel shouldn't be treated like any, less than any other country. And yet, Dafka and Israel, we hold it to chokehold. Why? And you realize why? And the answer is that there's no rational explanation why the United States treated Israel that way, why the whole world treats Israel that way. It goes back to, to, to deep-seated anti-Semitism, and I don't want to say Dhaka anti-Semitism, but a, 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 a subconscious, subconscious fear of, the, of what's going to happen if you give Israel Eretz Yisrael, which means Moshiach is coming. In other words, it's, there is, a, there is the, the, the it's a spiritual element. It's, it's, it's not wanting, it's the fight of Klippa wanting to remain Klippa. Not wanting to give away and become included in holiness. It's a struggle and it's a fight. So you see America fighting. And what did you see in the last couple of years that we were going, that the Klippa, the unholy, became very, very intense. I guess feeling their, spiritually, feeling subconsciously that their end is near. And started becoming more aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive. So now, when you have this unbelievable uh, occurrence, that the President of the United States of America, who won by, as we said earlier, by a miraculous election, and this definitely Yodai Aruchta, in my opinion, the way I see it, is a, he's a Yodai Aruchta, he's a longer hand of Melech HaMashiach. Because he keeps on stunning us again and again and again of doing amazing things. But why is he doing it? What's happening? And it's not only him. He's got the support of the entire American right, and primarily the whole Christian, believe you know, faithful religious um, um, core of the United States. People that believe in the Bible and so on and so forth. Believe that Israel belongs. Believe in the concept: those who bless her will be blessed. And they're giving tremendous support to the president and tremendous support to Israel. And he goes ahead. And makes these announcements, as we said before, Asit Chazer Litar, and you saw an amazing thing. In twofold, he supports he supports Eretz Yisrael. This is the Aliyah. This is the elevation. Again, unlike his predecessors, who never can bring themselves to make that support, who said and made promises, campaign promises, they're going to do it, but they never did it. And he goes ahead and he does it. Gives. Gives legitimacy to In other words, he's helping establish the Chisei David Meheira B'Sai Chatochen. Is what the Rebbeinu Bachayis says that this nation is going to rebuild Yerushalayim, rebuild the Beis Hamikdash. He's giving that support that that should happen. But at the amazing thing, on Purim he announces the Ramat, the the, uh, the the Golan, and then the interesting thing is on Shushan Purim. I don't know if you paid attention to the news. The news was that ISIS is finished. Now, isn't it interesting, the previous administration that was so against Israel and so against... Now the truth is, we find that the entire um, left wing in the United... I, I want to make a, a very important, dis, important announcement. I'm not saying that on the right side everybody's tzaddikim. There is an extreme elements on the right that are neo-Nazi and horrible, and we saw in Pittsburgh and so on and so forth. But we're talking over here, the general mood on the right side is extremely, extremely, extremely pro-Israel. And on the left side, what do we see? Number one, it's not just Israel. It's, it's, it's an entire attitude is a war against holiness. It's a war against faith in God. They don't want to get irritated if God is mentioned. They have a very strong atheistic belief. They want to take the Eberster out of everything. Take God out of, out of every mention of God. They've so many times tried to eradicate that and stop that. America is, in essence, a 
a country that's founded on belief and faith, even though the separation of church and state. But th th there is a strong resentment and anything religious, any anything holy, anything God. Then there is a destruction of family values, complete destruction of marriage. This is talking about the fabric of humanity. This is what the Abishter expects of Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach, that there should be a marriage between a man and a woman, and that a man is a man, and that a woman is a woman, and don't mess and don't fadre, and don't destroy the essential fabric. Don't teach kindergarten children that they can decide if they're men or they're women. You're basically destroying the world. And this is, this is the mindset of Klippa. This is, this is so anti Abishter, anti holy. And to add to that, their, 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 their support for abortions. And now they're coming out. You're seeing in recent months, you're seeing that the late-term abortion, and even to the point that after the baby is born already, if it's a botched abortion, we can go ahead and kill the baby. I mean, extreme fanaticism. So you see that it's all, and it's all a fight against everything holy, everything. And at the core of it is support was a war against Israel. At the core of it was to support the Palestinian cause see that there's a certain beer, a certain purification that's taking place, a separation that's taking place. And here's an amazing thing. This year, is the, we, we just finished, we just now had the APAC, maybe they're still in the middle of the APAC conferences. It's been already a rule in the United States that APAC is not, is not, um, is not uh, political. It's, it's American support, it's the Israeli lobbyists, and it, and it equally embraces Democrats and Republicans, the right and the left. And when you had these events, you had an equal representation from the right side and from the left side because everybody supported Israel. Not so right now. The Democratic contenders who are, who are beginning already to you know, flutter their wings to go up against President Trump in the 2020 election announced, many of them, that they're not going to APEC. They're not going to support Israel. That's a chidush nifla. It's an unbelievable uh, um, 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 novelty. We've never seen that before. In general, you're seeing so many Jews, sadly, that are entrenched in the left, are also want to separate Jew Jewish causes from Israel. Is that Israel is like becoming a taboo thing by the Jewish people, definitely in general by the left. And recently we've seen the, the anti-Semitic statements that were made by Omar and others and when, the, and when the left got together and, and, and when the Congress got together to try to condemn it and make a resolution against it, it was voted down. And instead of that, they made such a silly resolution that had nothing to do with what they should have done. I mean, it's unbelievable that we're seeing something like this. So we're seeing tremendously how the America is splitting and the right is going in one direction and the left is going in the other direction. So what does this mean? So I found something that was like blew my mind. It blew my mind. Tzemach Tzedek asks the question when he says that Chazer, which and Chazer is the elevation of, of, uh, of holiness, of the, of the elevation of Esav into Kedusha. So the, the, um, the, uh, the Tzemach Tzedek asks the question, how can we say that the Chazer is going to be tar? The Medrash says in Parshish Truma that Moshiach is going to receive is going to, uh, that, that, when, uh, that when they built a Mishkan, it doesn't mention Barzel. It mentions Zav, Kesef, and Achoshes. Gold, silver, copper, but from the metallics, it doesn't mention metal, Barzel, or steel. Why doesn't it mention steel? So the Medrash says, because Barzel represents Esau. And when Mashiach will come, Mashiach is going to receive gifts from all the nations, but not from Esau. Like it says in the Pasuk, Ga'ar Chayas Kone. He yells at the beast of the reeds. The beast of the reeds that is Yechazimeno Chazir Miyoar. That's the Chazir of the, the wild boar. That's Esav. At the Abish, the Mashiach is going to reject that. So the Tzemach Tzedek says, How do you reconcile these two Midrash? And that here it says that Mashiach is going to, that Edom is going to be elevated. And here he says it's going to be rejected. The Rebbe, and the Tzemach Tzedek doesn't answer the question. Our Rebbe brings the question of the Tzemach Tzedek. In Tav Nun, in his Vados, you can look it up. In, um, I'll take you to page, uh, uh, I don't have it right now in front of me. So the Rebbe Naha'ara brings the question. And the Rebbe says, Ula Yashloima, maybe we can say, that this, that Esau is going to be elevated, the Chazir, Asit Chazir Litoyer, that the Chazir is going to become purified, is after the Abish the first rebukes the, the, um, um, Esau. 
that Esau wants to bring a gift, and the Moshiach is going to rebuke, and by doing what, and Kaddish Baruch Hu is going to yell at them. Ga'ar chayas kona. What does it mean, ga'ar chayas kona? He yells at the beast of the reed. Is that he's going to chop off the left leg of the kona. What's the left leg of the kona? Kona, so in Hasidus, we learned this many times. In the Basil Agami, you're going to see, we're familiar with this. Kona is a kuf, the letter kuf. Kuf has a long leg. And that's, kona means a reed. So it says that the chopping off of the leg the, of, of uh, the, the, the Abish that yells at Chayas Kana, the beast of the room, means he's going to chop off his left leg. Ah, so we're talking about Esau, and we're talking about there's a right leg and there's a left leg. And as long as the left leg, leg is what the government stands on, as long as the left leg is standing, the Abish doesn't want to receive anything from that. And people ask me the question, you know, Obama gave billions of dollars to Israel, more than anybody else. God doesn't want that. Because on the back side, he gives money to Israel, but then he goes and he supports the Iran, the Iran nuclear deal. So it's again, it's a chazir, but it's a chazir with bad intentions. But the left has to be upgahakt, sliced. The left side is knocked off. And when the left side is knocked off, then there is the elevation of, and from the kuf, the Rebbe says, becomes a hey. And instead of the word kana becomes hine, 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 moshiach bo. It requires with chopping off the left side. Now again, if we say that this chazer that we're talking about, and the Rebbe says applies it to the chazer, that after the chazer is going to be chopped off his left leg, then what? It's going to be elevated. You can check up in the sikh. And I think this is an unbelievable remnant to what's happening right now. The left has been, first of all, chopped off. First of all, they became very aggressive. Right before this, this election, in 2015-14, they went to the extreme of a war against everything holy in this world. And then they were chopped off. Because in this election, there was a total chop. Boom! And part of that chop that we're seeing is that they are severing themselves entirely from holiness. It's amazing that the two, three or four contenders for president, including the Jews, sadly, Bernie, Bernie Sanders and maybe another Jew, announce that if they become president, the first, and then they say the first thing, they're going right back into the Iran deal. Are you ridiculous and saying, why are you going back? What, what's there to gain in this Iran deal? It's so crazy, it's because they've literally gotten married to evil. Iran, the Ayatollahs, these are the biggest supporters of terrorism, these are the root of all evil. Why are you running there? The answer is, it's crazy. It's, it's a fight that's Lamaila Matavadas. It's an animosity against Kedusha. It's the last fight. But you know what? They, they didn't come to APAC. There are those that are still went. Uh, Pelosi went. Schumer went. But they're all, and, and they're trying kind of to like keep the Jewish vote. But they themselves are terrorists from, are terrified from the progressives. And the progressives are running like mad in the other direction. And taking the, taking the Democratic Party. It's like the left is being amputated and separated. And remember what did we learn? That when the Ra, that's when the negative side of Noga falls away, Yizbalu v'yizbatlu kolaklipis, it all disseminates, it doesn't, it's based on lies. And what we're seeing right now is they're full of lies. Because this whole investigation on Trump was all based on, on, on Sheker. There was nothing there, and it's going to come out, just wait and see. It's going to come out more and more of the horrible corruption that was going on. But we see it's disintegrating, it's, it's falling apart. It's full of shkadim and it's full, sadly, I know I'm talking to shluchis, shluchim shluchis, um, you know, your constituents, most Jews, are so, so deeply entrenched with, in, 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 the, in the leftist ideas of the Democratic Party, but anybody that has eyes to see can see that they're falling on the wrong side. It's really scary. But here's the interesting thing. It's amazing that during the Obama administration, when the left was so strong, evil was prospering in the world. Evil was getting such power. And where did, where did the ultimate realization of evil in its ugliest, ugliest form was ISIS. ISIS was the ultimate, ugliest manifestation of Klippa. And the whole world shuddered when we watched them. They started their caliphate. And amazingly, we couldn't believe it. How is America not doing anything about it? They were gaining land and land, both in Iraq and in Syria. They took over tremendous swaths of land. And they were doing the worst crimes. 
and chopping people and filming it and burning people alive. We all have seen the horrors of that. And I remember once hearing, and I saw this, and then it's really interesting. ISIS, it's, he, it's not its Hebrew, but the way it's known universally, if you spell it in Hebrew letters, is Aleph Samach Yud Samach. So Samach and Samach, this is just an interesting thought. Samach and Samach is 60 and 60, is 120. Yud is another 10, is 130. Plus an Aleph is 131. It spells Samoel, Samach Mem Aleph. Lama, the name of the Sitra Achra, the name of the, of the, that's like the dregs of dregs. And suddenly, and it's interesting, I'm not talking the physical element of what Obama did or what Obama didn't do. It's just under his administration, this force of evil became such a powerful force that no one even realized how did they become so big? How did a terrorist organization almost become a new country? Now they wanted to make a caliph. Suddenly when Trump became president, they became started. I'm not saying what he did. I'm not talking about the physical elements that were done. That too, of course. The fact that he's fighting evil is a good thing. But you see that what? That they were reduced and reduced and reduced. And you know what they announced on Friday this last week? The day after he announced that the Golan belongs to Israel, the day later on Friday, they announced that ISIS is completely lost its last piece of land that they owned and they have zero caliphate. There's still terrorists around and they're still a danger, but they're not anymore have any land. They have no more achizah. They've been banished from earth. You know what that means? That's exactly what we're learning in Tanya. As Klip, as Esav, as Klipas Noiga, again, the United States Klipas Noga, supports and is elevated into Kedusha, becomes a power to support holiness fully, not wishy-washy, but it's full support. It cuts off the Klipa. And could, now, in addition to that's what he's been doing. What did we say? He, he actually closed the faucet. He shut down the billions of dollars that were going to Iran, which is part of what... When we say the elevation of Noiga means it doesn't allow any more leaking to Iran. And he went and he kicked the, 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 uh, um, uh, the Palestinian thing out of Washington. They don't have an office there anymore. They don't have a representation. He closed the, the in, 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 um, in Israel there was, in, there was an embassy, the main embassy that used to be in Tel Aviv. He moved to Yerushalayim. But there was something in Jerusalem which was not, not an embassy. I forgot what it's called. A, um, no. The word is not coming to my head right now. A different place, which was used by the Arabs mainly, and it was a direct, it bypassed the U.S. Embassy, and it was a direct access to the State Department. And they got, they got many underground things done through their direct influence in the State Department. He went and he shut them down. Basically, he's cutting off every single flow of energy to the Sitra Akhra and to the Klippa, stifling them. And here you have the elevation of Klippas Noga. And this is what the Rebbe is saying. And when does it happen in the United States? After the left and the right has been kind of blown apart. And the Rebbe says that. When can the Chazer be elevated? After Ga'ar Chayas Kana, after you chop off the left leg of, of the Klippa. Now interesting, that idea of chopping the left leg off and then changing the kuf into a hay, and then instead of becoming a power that fights godliness, it becomes the ultimate power, revealing the lukus from the word hine, 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 Moshiach ba, is this year's piece of Basi Legani. We know in Basi Legani every year we learn the Rebbe would give commentary and mimer on the different sif in Basi Legani, the Friedrich Rebbe's mimer. So it's this past year's Yud Shvat, Basi Legani, where the Rebbe talks about cutting off the left side of the of the kuf and turning it into hine ga'ar chayas kana. And to me it's clear that that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And that we're witnessing unbelievable. We just have to have lichte ge'oigen and the right way to see things, to see the emes. And this is the emes. We're seeing unbelievable lukus in front of our eyes. It's important that we understand this. And we push. Now again, of course, uh, these are my own thoughts. I, I can't say the Rebbe says these this, but this is what I'm seeing in the books, and I'm seeing in the world. I just want to conclude with one more thing. One of the slogans that they, they they're trying to fight Trump tooth and nail. Now they've lost terribly, but one of the slogans that they use is "Impeach 45." They keep on using that "Impeach 45." 
Why do they pick on the number 45? Because we know the power of birur that does the birur in Esau is the power of 45. Because we know that, uh, uh, that, 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 that there's, there's two things. There's the mevarer and the nizbarer. The mevarer is the koach of ma, the power of 45, the power of Adam. Adam is mevarer behema. Ma was mevarer ban. Ma does the birur in ban. Ban is 52, which is gematria behema. And, and Adam is gematria 45. And it's also gematria of one of Hashem's names. Yud Kevav Kei Mimilui Alfin. And that does the birur. So he's the 45th president, which is the Koyach HaMevar. He's not the Mevar, but he's the effect of the power of 45. And it's interesting that when he made his tweet regarding on Purim, and again, the dates are impeccable. He always picks the unbelievable times. And, it's, and it's, I'm sure there's no Kabbalist telling him when to make these announcements. He's doing it because it's, it's, it's the Abrish to showing us that he's behind it. So if he, in, his, in his tweet that he wrote, he said, after 52 years, it's time to recognize the, 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 the Golan. 52 is the, is the ban that's nizbar. This is the completion of the rectification of ban. It has to do also with the Golan, because Golan is not really part of Eretz Yisrael that God initially promised the seven countries. It's part, I think, of the ten nations, but it's definitely part of the Ever Hayarden that the Bnei God, Bnei God and Bnei Ruvain settled, which is part of the ten nations. It's part of the avoda of taking what's not Eretz Yisrael and making it Eretz Yisrael, Machda Eretz Yisrael, which is the bearer of the world. So therefore, when it's announced that that is legitimately ours, it means it's clearly an indication that we've been successful in the bearer of Ban. May we merit that we don't have to talk anymore in Muslim and signs, but we should be able to see already the third base of English fully revealed in our eyes. And if anybody has any comments and any ideas to share with me about this, please feel free. But let's just be realized that we're moving ahead full throttle. It's unbelievable what's happening. May we merit to see already the full redemption. Now.